Hi guys, this is Miss Sims. Um, I'm going to do the Civil Rights Movement today in our notes. Um, so we are going to skip forward a little bit. Some of our last notes that we talked about, we were talking about the Cold War. Um, so I don't know if you remember, but I said the Cold War goes on from pretty much 1940 till about 1991-ish. Um, so it's still going on, um, and there's still some really important discussions that are happening that are part of the Cold War. Um, and if you guys remember from um, when we talked in class, there was this thing called layers of history. So it's things that are happening at the same time. So the Civil Rights Movement um, and the Cold War, they're taking place at the same time. Um, and there's going to be a lot of times where they um, kind of intersect with one another and impact one another. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind that that is also happening. Um, another thing about this, the civil rights movement, and I'm using air quotes, I know you guys can't see that, but um, that's kind of a misnomer, meaning that the name is not quite right. Um, we call this the civil rights movement because this is when um, a lot of like laws, legislation are passed um, that have to do with um, racial equality in that sense. But you need to know that um, African Americans have been fighting for civil rights since the moment that slavery began um, in this country, even before it was a country, when it was still a colony in 1619. Um, so that has been happening. And African Americans um, like W.E.B. Du Bois and Ella Baker and um, Booker T. Washington um, and Ida B. Wells, these people and other people that we maybe don't know their names as well, um, they have been fighting for civil rights. It just hasn't worked. Um, so if you guys remember us talking about Plessy versus Ferguson, um, that was the Supreme Court case that made um, segregation legal, meaning it was allowed. Um, that was a part of the civil rights movement um, in itself. They were pushing and they were trying. They just failed. They weren't successful. Um, so this is called the civil rights movement because there was a lot of success. But I want you to keep in mind that this has been an ongoing um, building fight all along the way and it doesn't like this doesn't end in a nice neat way like it's going to evolve into something else that we're probably not going to have time to talk about because we've lost a lot of time um, with the COVID-19 stuff um, but the civil rights movement that we know um, usually we're talking about the nonviolent movement okay um, so Let's go ahead and kind of hit this um, and talk about this. So um, by 1950, the United States was um, a very segregated society, meaning that blacks and whites, um, and in some places where there are large amounts of Latinos um, as well, are going to be legally separated, okay? Um, so in the South, this is through what we know as Jim Crow laws, um, which are is legal segregation. That means that there are actual laws on the book that says um, whites and blacks can't be in the same space together, okay? That being said, um, we're going to see a lot of African Americans because of the Great Migration. If you guys remember, that was the movement of African Americans. It kind of started in World War I. It's going to continue into the 1960s, moving from the South, moving North um, to areas like New York and Chicago and Detroit and St. Louis and um, to a certain extent even out to California. Um, as African Americans have left um, the South and they've moved North, we're going to see that the North may not have these official Jim Crow laws, but they're going to have their own kind of segregation. So this is called de facto segregation, meaning that in fact, there is segregation, even though it may not be a law, um, which is what we would call de jure segregation, which is what you see up here. Okay. Um, so there is going to be segregation pretty much in the entire country, um, as a whole. Okay. And, in the north they are a little bit trickier about this um it's a little less obvious so in the south there's going to be signs that say um white only no negroes um no color those are going to be the terms that we see a lot um whereas in the north there may not be a giant sign but if you're african-american you're not going to be able to rent or even buy property in certain areas um, of the city that is deemed for whites only. Okay, so just so you understand that that segregation is happening all over the country. It is not just a southern problem. 
And we talked about that whenever we talked about lynching um, a while back, that lynch, that, that race is not a Southern problem. Um, it is worse in the South, um, but it is an American problem and it has been for a very long time. Um, okay, so a question that we need to ask is, why does the civil rights movement work now um, in the 1950s and the 1960s where it didn't work um, in the early 1900s um, or the late 1800s when Homer Plessy was trying to um, take his case to the Supreme Court or when W.E.B. Du Bois was starting the NAACP or Ida B. Wells was writing about lynching. Um, so those people, I'm sorry, I said Ella Baker earlier. Sorry, Ella Baker is during this time period. She's not from earlier. Um, sorry, that was a mix up. So just kind of ignore that if you were like, who the heck is Ella Baker? We haven't talked about her yet. So um, we will, um, hopefully we'll have time. But anyways, so the big question is, why does the civil rights movement work now? Well, the big thing is, is that World War II just ended. Um, and one of the big things that we were fighting in World War II was the Nazis. And if you think about the Nazis, you're going to think about their racism and their hatred for Jews. So basically what happens is um, Hitler and the Nazi party makes racism really ugly. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but I mentioned that... Um, that this hatred of Jews, this anti-Semitism, that is not a unique thing to Germany. Um, that has that is happening in the United States. It's happening all over the world. Um, there's a long, long, long history of hatred of Jews. Um, so it's not it's not like a new thing. But um, the Nazis made it on a large scale really ugly. Um, and so if we just fought a war to end racism um, against the Jews, if we are being racist as a country, the, the United States treating African Americans, our own citizens, um, like second class or third class citizens, you're going to see there's a problem there. OK, next issue. The Cold War is going on. And remember, I told you the Cold War is this epic popularity contest um, where the United States is representing democracy and trying to get everyone on their side. And the Soviet Union is representing communism and trying to get everyone on their side. The fact of the matter is, is the majority of the world is not white. The majority of the world is brown. And the United States does not have a very good record with how it treats brown people. Um, the way that the United States has dealt with um, Native Americans, the way that it's dealt with um, Latinos, the way that it's dealt with African Americans, um, just not done a great job. Um, so this whole idea that America is fighting for freedom and self-determination, which is a fancy way of saying democracy, people get to choose what kind of government they want. Um, when you don't let a lot of people vote, um, that's a problem. So basically the whole world is watching because of our next thing, the TV, like people are tuning in. They're looking at their newspapers. Um, they're looking at their TV. Um, and the world is watching the United States. And so when the United States says we're the greatest nation in the world because we allow people freedom and the right to choose their government, um, that next moment they're watching, um, terrible um, police brutality on um, African Americans marching for voting rights in Selma, um, beating African American men and women and children. Uh, there's a problem with that. And so part of the deal here is, is America is being held accountable um, for maybe the first time in a long time. Um, and so we're going to see because of that, because the world is watching, the civil rights movement is going to gain some traction. Okay. All right. Um, how is this movement going to be fought? So this, um, like I said, the civil rights movement is characterized by nonviolence. Um, and so that's really the answer that we're going to see here. Nonviolence. OK, we're going to go back. And look at this. Um, so this is Martin Luther King Jr. right here. Um, this is um, after Brown versus Board was decided. So this was super early in the movement. So this is like 1954. Um, so most of the stuff that Martin Luther King's doing is in the 1960s and the early 70s. Um, so this is very early in the movement. This is kind of the law that gets put on the books that all of this work that Martin Luther King um, and a lot of other people, Martin Luther King gets a lot of credit um, that in some ways he doesn't only deserve. So he um, is a fantastic leader, 
but he's not the only one doing stuff. He's doing a lot of stuff publicly, but there's a lot of other people that are working on the ground, um, putting together these networks, doing a lot of the work um, that King is going to get a lot of credit for. Um, but anyway, so um, that's kind of going on. And then down here, th this is kind of the sit-in movement um, that we're also going to talk about. So all of this is a part of um, the nonviolence movement. Okay, the biggest thing that I want you guys to keep in mind is this was a decision. This was not natural. And what I mean by that is the nonviolent movement was not, it didn't just happen out of nowhere. It didn't just happen naturally. People sat down and they discussed and they made a decision. This is how we're going to approach this. We're going to approach this using nonviolence. Okay. Um, the reason why I say this isn't natural is because if you guys think um, if someone comes and spits in your face, um, I would say 99% of us are going to react in some way. And if you are able to not react in that situation, um, if someone comes and beats your mother, you're not just going to sit there and take it. Um, so this idea of not fighting back, it is not natural. It is a decision that people make and they actually train themselves um, over like over years to respond in this way. And basically the reason is, is they knew this was the only way to shame America into making a change. Okay. And so this question of should we use nonviolence, should we not use nonviolence, um, they're going to decide to use the nonviolent like theory, but not forever. Okay, so that's when we're going to see the black power movement start coming up is when people are tired of the nonviolent movement and they basically say, okay, it got us this far. Let's let's try something different. Okay, so anyways, that is kind of the way that we are characterized this movement is the nonviolent movement. Okay. Okay, so like I said, Brown versus Board, this is going to be the first um, the first kind of big pivotal moment of what we would say is the Civil Rights Movement, okay? Um, if you go back even further, um, there is a little boy um, who is from up north. He is visiting his, um, I believe it's his grandparents, um, in the south. Um, he whistled, he supposedly, allegedly whistles at a white lady. In the middle of the night, they come and they pull him out of his bed. Uh, they beat him beyond recognition, kill him, tie him to a millstone, which is a big old stone used for grinding stuff, and they throw him in the river. And his name is Emmett Till. Um, his mom, Mamie Till, um, decides to let the New York Times take a picture of his open casket that shows how brutally um, this young man was beaten. That happens before Brown versus Board, um, and that moment is seared in the memory of every child and every mother and every father and grandmother um, in the African American movement. So that when Brown versus Board comes up, we see that there's already a history of putting children at the center of the movement. Um, and so Brown versus Board is another one of those uh, moments, okay? So the NAACP, this is an organization that's still around. It was started by W.E.B. Du Bois um, in 1908. Um, they are a group of lawyers, not just NAACP, but they have a group of lawyers that they are going to fight to show that this court case that happened a long time ago, Plessy versus Ferguson, that said separate is allowed as long as it's equal is crap. Um, so basically what they're going to do is they are going to look at lots and lots and lots of schools, black schools, white schools, and compare them. And you are going to see that black schools are never, ever equal. They always get the leftover textbooks. Um, they don't get buildings that are nearly as nice. Um, their teachers are not paid as much. Um, they don't get sports equipment. Um, basically, the community is having to pay for it. They're not getting hardly any public funds. Um, and as a result, this um, is in violation of the 14th Amendment. Okay, the 14th Amendment says if you are a citizen of the United States, then you have equal protection under the law. That means you have the same rights under the law as someone else. Those African-American children were not getting the same education. They were not getting the same rights as white children were. And so that is how they kind of go after this case. Um, as a result, Brown versus Board, Brown is going to win. So Brown is um, the family, that little girl that you saw. Okay, so what did Brown versus do? Why did black families want to change? So 
the Supreme Court unanimously decides, which means that all of them, and remember, this is an all this is an all white court, so this is a huge deal, um, decides that this ruling of Plessy versus Ferguson earlier, uh, these separate facilities they have not been equal so inherently means naturally unequal and so as a result they have to be desegregated all right this is 1954. in north carolina and in much of the south those black schools and white schools are not desegregated until the 1970s so even though this court case is on the books in the 1950s it's going to take almost 20 years for that to happen Hickory, North Carolina, Caldwell County, North Carolina, it's going to take until the 1970s for that to happen, okay? Um, and the Warren Court, we're not going to worry about that, but that's the name of the court. One thing I forgot to tell you, we're going to go back two slides. Okay, if you look at this picture, these are the lawyers um, that were a part of this legal team for the NAACP. Okay, this man right here in the center, his name is Thurgood Marshall. You maybe have heard that name, maybe you haven't, but he, at this time, he's a lawyer, he's not a judge. He is later going to be chosen as and appointed as the first African American um, judge on the Supreme Court, because at this time, there is there are no African American judges, they're all white he is going to be the first okay so he is a young lawyer on this um on this team this man right here is charles um hamilton houston he is really the mentor the the older brains and he's going to train him up um so just kind of a fun fact also another fun fact i met thurgood marshall's wife um thurgood marshall has died um i met his wife in dc and i got very very excited it was super cool okay so we already talked about this all right, and then this is just a reminder, what court case did Brown versus Board overturn? And we said that that was Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, and remember, that was the case that said segregation is okay as long as the facilities are equal. And we're basically finding out with Brown versus Board that they were never equal and they were never intended to be equal. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so this Brown versus Board decision was devices, divisive, meaning that it caused a ton of conflict. Okay, so schools in Baltimore, Maryland, um, St. Louis, D.C., they are going to integrate, but we're going to see that most Southern leaders are going to say, yeah, that's a cool case. I'm going to ignore that. Um, and we're going to see that the KKK is going to return um, to bl really block any kind of integration ha from happening so remember integration is just where blacks whites together okay um so southern states are basically going to ignore this for almost 20 years okay so at first the president at the time eisenhower is going to leave um the enforcement of this case up to the states um but he's going to see that basically they the states are not going to do this on their own because they don't want to um and the people the white people in the south who have all the voting power they don't want it either um so you've got a lot of african americans in the south but they don't have the right to vote because of jim crow laws they, they technically have the right to vote, but they've been kept from the right to vote because of Jim Crow laws. So these white politicians don't have to worry about being voted out of office by African Americans because they basically don't have the right to vote. Um, they are more concerned with um, whites. All right, so Little Rock Nine, this is kind of going to come to a head. So um, three years after Brown versus Board, we're going to see um, a high school in Little Rock, Arkansas, is going to try to um, desegregate. And when I say desegregate, I don't mean the whole school. Basically, they take nine kids, uh, nine African-American kids, and put them in a whole high school. Um, and these are like the cream of the crop students. Like these are your honor students most well-behaved, um, best of the best students um, to make this happen. And basically what happens is um, the president, President Eisenhower, is going to be forced to support integration through this whole situation. Um, the governor of Arkansas, um, his name is Orville Falvis, um, he's crazy, and he's going to call in the National Guard um, to keep these nine black students from um, coming into his high school. So if you can imagine this picture um, of armed um, National Guard against nine high school students, um, and nine honors high school students. So these are not like strong muscly high school students these are like your honor students guys um and so this is going to be 
all over the news and it's going to force Eisenhower, who's the president at the time, to send in the army to force um, the governor to allow these nine black students um, into the school. And this isn't just like on day one, day two. This is the entire year. These students are walked with armed guards. You see in this picture, um, the army, the, the U.S. Army, who has just fought in Korea, um, who has fought in World War II, that armed guard is going to escort nine students around high school for an entire year. OK, um, and these students are going to be, become known as the Little Rock Nine because it was in Little Rock, Arkansas. OK, again, these are the students here. Um, and then this is their guard every single day of high school. All right, we're going to skip this. I'm going to link. Um, I'll go back. I'm going to link um, this Prezi. Um, in your Google Classroom. So if you want to go back and watch this, uh, this is really good. It kind of shows um, the craziness surrounding it. Like, I believe that I believe it's this clip. There's one point where um, a crazy white man takes a brick and beats um, a black reporter over the head with the brick. Like this is how like crazy people are about allowing nine black honor students into the white high school. Like people felt really, really strongly about it. OK, so moving on. Um, after that, the next big movement that we're going to talk about is going to be the Montgomery bus boycott. This is going to be the moment um, that Martin Luther King Jr. is going to become um, kind of this iconic celebrity like figure. And he's going to be the man that they call in throughout the movement whenever they need national media, because they know after this, they know if Martin Luther King is there, um, he's going to get put on TV like the news reporters will show up. OK, at this point, Martin Luther King is 25 years old. To y'all, that may seem old. Um, that's five years younger than I am. Um, so 25 years old is, is fairly young. Um, and again, he is um, at this point, he's not he doesn't have that prestige. This is um, he is being brought in as an out of towner so that he cannot be um, persuaded by um, or bribed by um, the local government. OK, he is just a young preacher. Um, he's very well spoken. Um, and that's kind of why he's going to be um, picked. OK, so what you need to know about the Montgomery bus boycott, um, this is where Rosa Parks comes in. Um, this didn't just happen. OK, Rosa Parks is a secretary for the NAACP. This woman was not just tired and said, I'm not going to give my seat up on the bus um, and unknowingly started a movement. No, she knew what she was doing. This woman um, had trained in nonviolence, was a secretary of the NAACP um, for years. She is an organized, educated woman. OK. Um, and there were other people who had protested um, this segregation on the bus system um, before her, but they were not selected as the face of the movement because um, there was young, one young woman who um, had a child out of wedlock. And so she couldn't be selected. Like they were very intentional about who they selected because they wanted the best of the best um, that could not be um seen as immoral in any way. And you guys have to understand that um, having a child outside of wedlock in the 1950s was a whoo, whoo, big, big, big deal. Um, so anyways, Rosa Parks is um, a very nice church lady. Um, and so she, whenever she decided she was arrested, she decided she wasn't going to get up um, from her seat and ended up being arrested. And so they decided to use that arrest as a spark for the movement. Okay. They then called this whole network of people in Montgomery and said, all right, we are going to stop riding the bus. And basically they do that for almost an entire year. And as they do that, you have to understand that these folks are riding the bus for a reason to get to work because they don't have a car. So it has to be very organized about how these people are going to get to work because they we don't want them to lose their jobs, things like that. But basically all in all this, the Montgomery bus boycott brings nonviolence to the center faith, Christianity, um, 
as the center of the movement. You've got a pastor, you've got a nice church lady. Um, all of that is going to be infused in this movement. Um, and this moment, the Montgomery bus boycott, this lasts about a year. Um, this is going to set the stage for what the whole civil rights movement, like what we would call the civil rights movement looks like. Okay. All right. Moving on. After that, they are able to desegregate the buses um, in Montgomery. After that, we move to Birmingham. Um, King gets arrested in Birmingham for protesting. And basically what happens is um, they are protesting because they want public facilities and school, better employment opportunity for African Americans, um, more services for black communities. So basically black communities were paying taxes, um, but not getting any of the services that they were supposed to like trash pickup, um, having like decent roads or lights, different things like that, and some good low income housing. Um, so the goal of this was to get the government, the federal government to pay attention. Um, and the way that they were, the reason Birmingham was picked was because, um, Bull Connor, I think he was a police commissioner in Birmingham. He is crazy. And I mean, crazy with a capital C crazy. Um, and they knew that he would put on a show, like be over the top and violent. And if they did that, the, the um, folks that are trying, um, King and his group that are trying to um, fight this would use their nonviolence. And basically what you would see is crazy Bull Connor and um, his police force um, being crazy against um, this group of African Americans who were so, like calmly um, protesting. And again, this is very planned out. Like these folks that are coming to um, protest nonviolently, they wore their Sunday best. They made sure that their hair was perfect. They made sure that their clothes was perfect because they wanted to look the most civilized to show that these crazy white guys like Bull Connor and the police um, are crazy and that they're the uncivilized people. Okay. King gets arrested. Leaders within the African American community are going to grumble about King getting arrested and basically saying like, are you a really good face of the movement if you're going to end up getting arrested, even though he got arrested for protesting nonviolently. And this is where King writes his response of letter from Birmingham jail, um, which I think that you guys have probably read in your English class. Basically is where King writes back that, um, that this is worth, worth everything. We cannot continue, um, to wait on that to happen. Okay. Pretty much everyone that was protesting is now in jail. So now, um, you're going to see the only other protesters available are going to be kids. The leadership is very um, nervous about allowing children to protest, um, mainly because the police have been pretty brutal. They've used water, ho um, like fire hoses, which is not just like getting hit with a water hose. Like it is a lot of like it would bruise your skin. It was so hard. Um, they have tried to use police dogs. Um, they've beaten people and they just don't know. The leadership doesn't know that they want kids um, to be involved with that. OK, um, but what's going to end up happening is these kids are basically like, no, we want to be a part of this. Um, and basically the leadership gets to a point where they don't really have a whole lot of um, a whole lot of choice. And so these children are actually going to come from school to protest. And as a result, um, their moms are going to come and protest as well after like seeing their kids protest just as a attempt to protect their kids. Um, Bull Connor is going to be so angry that he arrests the children, beats them with nightsticks, sets dogs on them. And like I said, as a result, that is going to get those kids' parents to come and protest in later protests. And those kids' parents um, had not been involved in the movement. So basically, this is going to push um, the movement even further to more people participating. Okay, so what you have to keep in mind about the mindset of the dissidents. So the dissidents are people that are protesting. Um, they planned this out, okay? Um, and they knew that a black man or a black woman getting beaten in the South is not worth it because that's been happening since 1619. Like black people getting beaten, that doesn't change anything. But if a black person is beaten and it is captured on camera, 
that could change something. And you guys know that that is still true today um, to a certain extent, okay? Um, you've seen as, um, as there has been videos um, of people um, being beaten that that causes a movement. And that is not a new concept. That has been around for a long time. So basically, um, there was an idea that you don't let yourself get beaten unless there is a camera to show it because it's not worth it um, if that's not going to be shown on TV to make a change. Like you just dying is not worth it. Okay. Also, they're doing this legal move. So Charles Hamilton, Houston and Thurgood Marshall, they're doing the legal stuff. So it started with Brown versus Board. They're also doing some other cases. So they're doing that too. Also, we talked about being on the global stage. So Part of that, why it's important that it gets on video is um, so it can be watched around the world and America can, be, America can be held accountable. Okay, there has also been a push for government involvement. So with Reconstruction after the Civil War, the New Deal after the Great Depression, there has been a move for the government to be more involved in matters um, of social things. So there is hope that maybe the government will get involved in this. OK, again, Supreme Court cases. And then the goal, the, the end goal is getting African-Americans the right to vote, because if African-Americans can vote, then they can be a part of this democracy and they can hold um, politicians accountable. So if politicians do hateful, mean things, you just don't vote them in next time. But if African-Americans can't vote, there's no way to hold them accountable. So that's kind of all of the things that are in the background of this leadership of what they're trying to focus. They're not just going from like one random event to the next. They're making sure that it all fits into this like larger movement. And you guys have to understand that there's lots of different groups that are doing different things. So um, King has a group that's called the Southern Christian Leadership Corps. They're doing their thing. There's going to be a student group that's called SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, there's going to be several NAACP. There's several different groups that are attacking this problem from different angles. And they're all kind of working together, but they're accomplishing different things. Okay. All right, March on Washington. So this is where King gives his I Have a Dream speech. So this is 1963. So we are not quite 10 years from um, the Montgomery bus boycott, but this is where the momentum from Birmingham, the momentum from Montgomery, um, those things have been happening, but they want to cast a vision, okay? And so we're going to see a quarter of a million people show up at the Lincoln Memorial um, to hear King and other people um, give speeches. And so King is going to give this I Have a Dream speech. Now, this is not the first time that King has given this speech. He's given this speech before, and I believe it was in North Carolina was the first time that he gave it. Um, so this is actually, I believe, the second time that he gives this speech. But this speech, I Have a Dream, it's casting a vision. He's explaining what his dream is um, for America going forward. And if you guys have heard the speech before, he says, I have a dream that my little children will hold hands um, with little white children and they will be and go on, go on, go on, go on. And then will be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And so that is kind of the vision, casting vision. OK, what you have to understand is the logistics of this March on Washington is crazy town. Like they didn't know how many people were going to show up. You have to remember, this is white people and black people. But all of the black people that show up, um, this is D.C. D.C. is still segregated. So it's not like they can go stay in a hotel or go to a restaurant and get lunch. Like there are no accommodations for these African-American people. Um, there's still segregation. Um, so the organization that are putting this on, they have to provide a lot of that stuff. So basically what happens is all these buses start rolling in and these these organizers say, oh my gosh, people are coming. Oh my gosh, people are coming. Like they thought that the people that were going to come was going to fill these seats right here. They filled all this, all this very far, a lot, a lot of people. So basically they start making bologna sandwiches like really, really fast just to feed these people. Okay. Um, and so this is kind of where we're at, that the movement is starting to really grow and take hold um, and 
this is going to be televised. This is casting the vision um, for the whole civil rights movement. Okay. Okay. So after this, we're going to see the decline of the nonviolent movement. We're not going to talk about this yet. We're going to talk about this tomorrow, but that is where we're going. So you need to understand that this concept of nonviolence it's not going to last forever. You can only be beaten and hold your tongue so many times before um, you get frustrated. OK, and you guys have to keep in mind that we're already at like eight or so years of doing this. OK, so people get tired. OK. All right. So that is where we're going to stop. We'll pick up tomorrow. OK. Maybe if I can get my computer to stop. All right. Thanks.